We're very, very delighted to be able to um, welcome here Janusz Potocznik. I'll call you Janusz, if that's okay. Um, former European Commissioner. Actually, European Commissioner for Research um, before he became European Commissioner for the Environment um, from 2010 to 2014. Now, I can say from my own perspective, at least, I think you were one of the founding fathers of circularity, um, circular economy initiatives at the European Commission. And um, I actually went into the archives and dug out a speech that you gave probably a few weeks before you left. And I'm going to read it out to you and then ask you a question and then ask you to join the floor, okay? So in June 2014, you said, we need a new revolution. This was just after you launched the Circular Economy Initiative in the European Commission. And then you went on to say, I'm not letting you in on any secrets if I tell you that within the European Commission, it has proven very difficult to push through environmental measures during these times of crisis. It's proven very difficult to integrate environmental considerations into other policy areas. And I suspect almost every environment minister in the world will tell you the same thing. So my question to you is, did we get a revolution? Um, and, and is that still the case? Um, and I'll invite you to join us here and look forward to your word. The answer is pretty uh, straightforward and easy. By the way, uh, it, it was indeed, it, there was not many fathers of the circular economy during that, those days, uh, that was mid of 2014. Uh, circular economy was entirely controversial in commission. It was controversial to an extent, I don't know if you remember, that the next commission removed it from the agenda. And on the pressure which came also from the side of all of those like you who participated in the preparation of that program, it was actually in more than a year time put back on the agenda. So I will talk about resource per secretary of the transition to a sustainable economy. So uh, you have heard that I'm co-chairing international resource panel. It's a kind of a sister organization on UN level. IPPC is dealing with climate change, IPBS with biodiversity loss, and we are dealing with natural resource management, which is actually the closest link to the economy because the way how you manage natural resources is actually telling you a lot. So what are the main diagnoses from our lenses of the problem which we are facing? If we look to this, uh, it's a biomass of life. Then you see anthropods, uh, fish, and going down there. Actually, humans are here, and you would be surprised how few are actually wild animals and wild birds in that kind of a, a composition of, of natural biomass. This is actually animal biomass. And if we look to these animals comparing to the rest, bacteria, plants, uh, and so on, I could continue, you could see that we actually, in a global world, represent a relatively minor part of everything which is here around us. But what is more surprising is that this biomass, which is actually natural, it's already surpassed by the anthropogenic mass, the mass which we have created as humans. So concrete, bricks, aggregates, metals, asphalt. And if we look to the predictions, Predictions are that till 2040, this will be triple size of the left size. So that's where actually we are going. And if you look, the plastic kingdom, it's currently double size comparing to the animal kingdom. For the first time in human history, we are the first generation which is actually dealing or living in a socio-ecological space of planetary scope. So we are more interconnected and interdependent than humans were ever, which means that our individual and collective responsibility has enormously increased. Club of Rome has nicely summarized that by saying that we have moved from so-called empty world dominated by nature to the full world dominated by humans. And empty world, in empty world it was labor and infrastructure which were the limiting factor of human well-being, while today it's actually natural resources and environmental things, which are the limiting factor of human well-being, which means that if you not consider that in your economic thinking of the future, you are basically hampering your economic future. You have heard about this, uh, uh, this uh, donut, uh, uh, donut kind of approach, which is basically saying that in the inner part of the circle are human needs, 
which are expiring, uh, expanding. Sorry. And on the outside, you have the planetary boundaries, so the limits which are existing of absorption in practically all the areas. So what is basically happening is that already today we are overshooting some of the planetary boundaries in the climate change, in the nitrogen phosphorus loading, land conversation and biodiversity loss. If I were to be frank, and this, is, this was published two days ago, it's actually the novel uh, renewal of the same and it's adding the fresh water to the story. So the problems are not getting better, they are actually getting worse. But the fact is that these are different stories in different countries, Malawi, China, Belgium, Australia. So if I would put all the countries together, I could basically put them in three parts, where in the first part, left hand, you have the countries which are low on, on transgressing planetary boundaries, but also low on social, so on well-being. Then right-hand side, you have those who are not yet going quickly up, but quickly going right, so transpassing planetary boundaries, and we are all in the yellow circle up there. So we are living well, but of course transgressing planetary boundaries in many ways, and the authors basically said that there are many reasons from colonialism, military power, trade finance rules, resource extraction, climate change impacts, and one can continue. The Dasgupta review of bioeconomics, uh, of uh, economy of uh, biodiversity, was very clear and very precise where it's actually the core of the problem. And they have said that this could be found in institutional failure, so we have simply organized ourselves so that institutionally we do not cope with those issues, but even more, in the failure of contemporary economics, and by the way, I'm professor of economics and I can confirm that that's 100% true, which is considering humans as external to nature and not part of nature at all. And that's also our behavior. If I go now and translate that to market and markets, what is happening on the market? You know that producers and consumers on the markets behave rationally. And by the way, we do behave rationally. But we behave on the basis of the signals which we are getting. And what are those signals telling us? Why this rational behavior for here and now for us, it's not rational for the long term? Because production capital, financial capital is overvalued, overrewarded. Human capital is undervalued, underrewarded, and natural capital, unfortunately, it's in many cases not valued at all. So if we put all that into the story, we can just dream about economic, social, and environmental balance because the signals which we receive as producers and consumers and we behave then rationally are simply sending us in the direction where they are sending us. And with all the regulation which we create, what we do, because this is trying to defend public interest, we just do a lot of confusion on markets where something is sending us here, the other is sending us there, and then we have a lot of lobbying, a lot of conflicts, and that's the situation which we are facing. Which leads me to the resource management. Normally, when we approach in IRP to those story, we look it through the so-called DPSIR, driver's pressures, state impacts, and response logic. When we talk about climate change, biodiversity, loss pollution, we basically talk about state impact. But when we talk about drivers and pressures, we are immediately in humans' story and in economic story. And why the dealing with natural resources is so important part of the story, because it's a kind of bridge between economy, because it's decisive for your success. But on the other hand, the irrational use of those natural resources is causing climate change, is causing biodiversity loss, it's causing pollution. That is the core reason of everything. So, Natural resources have been, have been in the human history always closely related to stability, conflicts, and war. We see that pretty much today in Europe. According to the, our research, it's not actually, except in specific cases, the shortage of various kind of natural resources which will drive us to change our behavior, but it's actually environmental and health consequences of the overuse and the side effects of that which are driving us to change our behavior. When we say natural resources, we basically mean biomass, metals, that's about when we talk about language, uh, fossil fuels, non-metallic minerals, and all that together is called materials. So everything extracted from Earth are materials. 
And then on the top of that, you have water and land, which are a bit different, but all that creates natural resource story. If we look to the materials used in the last 50 years, it has tripled in the last 50 years, material use globally. It has almost doubled per capita, which means that majority of that tripling its economics and to a lesser extent it's also population growth. But what is most interesting is this fact. Material productivity, that's the efficiency of the use of materials per unit of GDP. That's this black line. It was growing till 2000 and then starting to drop. How is that possible if material productivity is growing in all the countries? Because we have a structural shift of production from the countries like Europe and Japan to the countries which are less resource efficient, like, uh, like I don't know, Indonesia, China, and so on. And that means that per unit of GDP, we are currently consuming more resources than in the year 2000. When we look to the impacts, environmental impacts of materials in the value chain, uh, so we found out that 90% of global biodiversity loss and water stress can be devoted to that. It's, to be blunt, it's agriculture, forestry, and a bit of ocean story. Then 50% of the global climate change, it's connected to that and one-third of the air pollution. If we look in specifically to non-metallic minerals, we can see that uh, they are responsible for 10% of the climate change impacts and 8% of air pollution. But when you look to the rest, so water and biodiversity, it's basically more biomass. If current trends would continue, according to our research, uh, material consumption is predicted to double, so if we want to continue growing from the well-being point of view, it's only one way. We have to decouple from material use, and we have to decouple both from environmental impacts, which is leading me very, very shortly to the European Green Deal, because it was mentioned and because it's pretty much decisive to, for your life. So something, I was carefully listening to you, something which people normally do not take into that subconscious no net emissions on greenhouse gases in 2050. Everybody has remembered that and everybody has forgotten economic growth is decoupled from resource use. So that is the part on which I try to point my finger. A lot of circular action plan, as you know, has brought a lot of very practical solutions to guide this recovery in more sustainable practices. Let me try to share with you, we all see now and sense that European Green Deal is quite challenged due to the COVID and terrible war. Uh, we have seen food and energy prices rising, uh, ener economies in Europe stretched. So energy, food, material crisis are topics the governments today talk about. And uh, how to improve strategic autonomy of Europe. It's paramount that we address these knock-on effects but it's even more important not to use them as an excuse to continue on sustainability because it's about resilience. If we, want, if we don't want to end in that kind of situations which would be more terrible than this, we have to prepare ourselves. So we are, Europe in particular, dependent, fragile. We import more than half of our energy. We import almost 90 plus percent of precious metals and so on, so we are vulnerable continent. And that's why it comes pretty much to the system change log logic and approach, which I will explain a bit more in detail later, reassessing our values, rethinking our economies, reducing cons overconsumption. Efforts for strategic autonomy should of course not lead us to a kind of new protectionism, but to new concepts of production and consumption that are saving resources reducing the use of virgin resources. So circular economy is a typical uh, strategic tool for Europe and its future competitiveness. Standards, and that's one of the things which I, we, we also have to be honest to ourselves and not forget, standards behavior of this economy which we live in were set by high income countries. So don't point on the others that they cannot, should not repeat the things which we have done, but rather show that we are ready and able, that the things could be organized differently and help them that they would not repeat some of the mistakes from the past. Which leads me to the circular economy. I consider it simply as an instrument for delivering the coupling I was talking about, but also 
as a kind of part of bigger picture of economic, social, and cultural transformation. So you know all those things about better minimize product needs through better uh, system design, so refuse, rethink strategies, leaner, reduce strategies in manufacture and use longer, maximize lifespan of products, reuse, repair, refurbish, remanufacture, and of course, uh, of course, recycle also, and cleaner, minimize waste and pollution recovery strategies. All that, it's needed and valuable. But since I, I, I was in policy making, I knew that we haven't done nothing on number one, because it's too difficult. So actually, our economy still mostly optimizes product by product output, sector by sector, maximizing debt and maximizing GDP based on the cheap virgin materials. And this logic easily overlooks the great potential for deeper innovations to service-based business models and can hinder shifts across sectors towards de decoupling this value creation. This is uh, the thinking which we will need to embrace, like it or not. We don't need cars. We need mobility. We don't need light bulbs. We need light. We don't need chairs. We need to sit comfortably. So it's about dematerialization. Rethinking ownership will be the core name of the game. And of course, we will need to move from the efficiency also to ask ourselves sincerely a question of sufficiency. If I give you just an example of light bulb, and you will then understand very easily why that is so important from resource perspective. If you are selling light bulbs, the producer is actually on the basis of number of light bulbs which are sold, creating its profit. If you are selling light, it's just the opposite. You are still, as the consumer, receiving the same light, but producer is incentivized to use as few light bulbs for providing you that, which of course turns the whole philosophy upside down, which means that you, you don't need the ecosystem directive. You just need the right system and you have ecosystem inbuilt in market economy. Climate management and circular economy, I firmly believe that policy improvements are there needed because current approach is mainly based on optimizing greening the current economic model. Also, if we are honest, also yourself, I'm mostly talking about that, which is important part of the, uh, just don't misunderstand me, crucial part actually, but it's not all. We don't, so we mainly address supply side problems, but we don't, we ignore systematically who is over consuming and whose impact is actually causing the climate change. And this is actually driving the gap between low and high income countries just deeper. And how the low income countries are reacting, they are just asking more and more financial transfers because it's fair and because they have no other answer, because we don't talk about how to go to the roots of the problem. So in essence, also the whole philosophy of the climate talks, it's around energy bubble, energy climate bubble. None of the people from industry, agriculture, transport, trade, social matters, finance, are actually going on conventions. But majority of the answers are also in their hands. When we analyzed uh, the NDCs of G20 countries, we find out that in built environment, in energy efficiency, you have 10 times more measures than actually in resource efficiency in NDCs. And in mobility, it's slightly better, but it's still four times. So it's Practically, the, the resource and circular economy story and the material footprint, it's ignored in the whole story of the climate. Through the research which we have done in the past, uh, we have found out uh, that that was uh, IRP research. Uh, it's uh, focused on homes, so uh, built environment. We found out this is if you implement and use only already agreed energy measures, but reserve additional reserve in G20, G7 countries is approximately 35% uh, if you use also material measures. And in China and India, it's actually 60%. So there is a major possibility still in those measures, which are very important. And when we look to the, which are the most effective measures, you actually come to the conclusion, more intense use and recycling are most important strategies which you can use to uh, meet the goal. So 
what would be needed is that this UNFCC logic or climate logic, which is currently via the carbon emissions, actually looks at all those places around because they are all part of the same transitional story. Otherwise, you simply create additional trade-offs, additional lock-ins, which other people not exactly in the climate will have to deal with, but also the people in the climate will have to deal with. So a resilient economy and society, it's consistent, holistic view to how the things are interconnected. And this is basically the current approach of the climate story, carbon management energy, that's what is missing. And that is also to a large extent missing. But if you want to deal with the climate, you need combination of supply side, demand side, and nature-based solutions. Not just the number one, the, the orange part. We are now in the IRP, just in the final phase of producing the Global Resource Outlook 23. What will be, so we will have two fundamental changes in approach and logic. First, we will move from maximizing production to maximizing human needs. And we will move from maximizing GDP to maximizing well-being. When we talk about human needs, it's nutrition, it's built environment, mobility, and daily functional needs. Maybe I would today add also uh, health. But why this? Because humans have many other needs, sport, culture, and so on. These are resource intensive. These are really important for climate, blah, 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 and other things. And when it comes to enabling systems, actually, nature-based solutions, energy, materials, and innovation, digitalization are the most important. So these on the right, gray ones, are not human needs. But they are enabling that we deliver human needs. But why they are important? Because they are also resource intensive. Because they are also causing the problem. If you would be interested, by the way, I would, be, I would love to give you one hour presentation of the System Change Compass, which we have created, uh, Systemic and Club of Rome. It's actually telling you the story of transformation, which each one would need to go through. And uh, we have now, in this Global Resource Outlook, connect the whole story with indicators, objective, provisioning systems. And we took all those indicators, more or less, from the SDG agreed system, so that we stay stay consistent with the logic which was developed there. What would this mean in policy terms? Redefining consumption from owing to using. Redefining production from mass sales to providing efficient functionalities. Redefining core economic incentives such as taxation, subsidies, and public procurement. Integrating well-being as an objective across all policies. Measuring sustainability with a life cycle perspective. Harmonizing it across all policy measures, areas activating all financial potential to enable transition, looking at innovation in categories of economic ecosystems that provide societal functions rather than just in categories of production sectors, and I could continue. With one sentence summary, if we want to avoid the extinctions of elephants in nature, we need to extinct elephants in the room. So we need to start talking about everything. To conclude, Science, it's convincing and change is unavoidable. Get a nicely set. Uh, knowing it's not enough, we must apply. Willing it's not enough, we must do. And uh, being in a state of denial is simply just postponing the inevitable. Of course, at a higher cost. So there has never been a better moment to move from the history of resource-driven imperialism because it is still existing, but in a hidden way, into an era of responsible use of natural resources, mitigating resource fragility, and strengthening our preparedness and resilience. And this is the only slide about your industry. The future of your industry, built environment, it's an important resource-intensive human need, which means that it will receive a lot of policy attention in future transitional efforts. That has to stay with you, because this will happen. Second, gypsum is in theory fully recyclable and closed loop material. It is ideal for implementing circular practices, uh, circular economy practices, and you are uh, fortunately more aware of that than myself. Efforts linked to make your industry sustainable are important, important and highly valuable. 
but you should also play a proactive role in optimizing and reducing the material needs in built environment supply chain, which provides human needs. And finally, the future of your industry will be on a safe side, only if with our collective efforts we will keep also the planet and humanity on the safe side. So, from the resource management point of view, there are two things which you should remember. Decarbonization, decoupling. And the question which you have to ask is, what does that mean for me? And how should I best prepare and reorganize myself locally and globally? These are the questions which each and every industrial sector needs to ask itself. Circular economy is, of course, not a new concept. It's the oldest concept on the planet Earth. Nature is bioeconomy based on the principles of circularity, so nothing is lost. Everything has its own purpose. So the core question which we have to answer is this one. Do we agree that humans are part of nature too? Because if we will positively answer that question, a lot of things are then easier to conclude. And if somebody still has the doubts about that, let's ask for the advice, the famous Belgian detective Hercule Poirot, since we are in Belgium, this is appropriate, when he was once uh, when asked why he is speaking about himself always in the third person, he replied something like that. If one is such a genius like myself, it's very important to establish a healthy distance to himself. <laughs> so I think that's a really important message to humans. If we think, being the most intelligent in the globe, that then if we really want to play that role, and we should because nobody else will, then we have in the first place establish a healthy distance to ourselves, take care for the rest of living beings, and also take care for the future of humanity. Thank you.